I welcome you all to the lecture number 11 of the course title Psychology of Emotions Theory and Applications. So, this is module number 5 uh, and <coughs> this is the second lecture of module 5. Module 5 is about positive emotions and happiness. <coughs> so, in this module we are talking more about uh, the positive emotions and uh, the associated concept of happiness. So, in the lecture 10 uh, in under this module we have already discussed about the concept of positive emotions and uh, we have discussed diverse aspects associated with it. Uh, today's lecture uh, we will be talking about this is titled as happiness and subjective well being part 1 and we will have one more lecture on this concept of happiness uh, that is lecture number 12 under this module. So, in the last lecture we talked about positive emotions and uh, we have discussed the difference between positive and negative emotions. Uh, the basic difference basically lies in the subjective experiences. So, there is a sense of you know uh, under positive emotion there is a sense of positive experiences in terms of experiences they are very different and uh, we have discussed how they are different and uh, we try to define what are positive emotions. Uh, we have also discussed uh, 10 po common positive emotions uh, uh, which was proposed by Barbara Fredrickson and uh, we have discussed each of them and at the end we have discussed the different functions of positive emotions. What are the purposes they serve through a particular theory which is called as broaden and build theory. Uh, so, the, the name of this theory is broaden and build theory which typically says that positive emotion broadens our thought actions. So, one of the distinguishing characteristics between positive and negative emotion is that you know whenever we experience positive emotions there is a sense of broadness openness there is a sense of expansion in our thought processes as well as in our action the the various actions that we do uh, on the other hand negative emotions typically narrows our perspectives or narrows down our perception so that is one of the basic differences that we have discussed Another important thing that positive emotions also builds resources, uh, it includes physical resources, psychological resources, social resources and so on. Positive emotions also kinds of uh, facilitates you know uh, or kind of uh, you know does positive functions in terms of promoting health because negative emotions are associated with a uh, lot of uh, illnesses. So, positive emotions kind of undoes the negative impact of or the lingering impact of negative emotions and in that context they also promote health both physical as well as you know uh, it has also impact in the uh, mental health as well. So, we have discussed different functions uh, uh, of positive emotions and how why they are so important in terms of cultivating them. Uh, so, these are some of the important uh, concept that we have discussed in the last class. Today, we will be talking about the concept of happiness and it is the first lecture on happiness, we will have one more lecture on the concept of happiness. So, we will be talking about psychology of happiness, we will talk about uh, one theoretical model to discuss the concept of happiness, we will also talk about what makes us happy, in that context we will be talking about one concept called as affective forecasting. I will try to understand how happiness is influenced by our you know uh, forecasting and so on of the future events. So, let us start today's lecture. So, the concept of happiness is is as old as humanity and it is an it is a universal goal means this concept is pursued by people in every culture in every every human being the core of all human motivation is to seek happiness whatever we do is is ultimate the foundation of it is that people want to be happy. So, it is one of the most fundamental aspects which kind of unites all humanity and it can be understood from this one statement given by Pascal. Uh, it is very beautifully he captured this essence of the concept of happiness and why it is so universal. So, he said all men seek happiness, it is without exception. So, there is no exception that no one is there in this world who seek who is not seeking happiness. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. Whatever means they are trying to achieve this, ultimately they are trying to achieve happiness through different means. The cause of some going to war and for others avoiding it, it is the same desires in both. Whether somebody is waging a war 
or somebody is avoiding it, the ultimate purpose is to seek happiness. So, for someone waging a war will give them happiness, for someone avoiding it will be happiness. The ultimate motivation is the same motive, underlying motive is the same to seek happiness. It is the same desire in both attended with different views, different pathways. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. So, it is a kind of ultimate statement he has given. No? Even people who kill themselves or commit suicide, ultimately probably they are thinking that it will give them some kind of happiness or relief. So, this is one of the most fundamental or universal aspect of human being that we all are seeking happiness and it is something that unites all of us, irrespective of culture, uh, countries, ge geographical location and so on. So, it is a ha happiness is a highly valued in the society, at the individual level as well as at the collective level. Not only do people aim at happiness in their own life, but also care for the happiness of other people and that even government should aim at creating greater happiness for the greater number of citizens. So, the ideally, obviously, we individually also we all seek happiness. Ideally, we all aim at collective happiness in terms of society or government. The main purpose of all governance is to give maximize happiness among the citizens. So, it is the most valued concept. Whatever people are doing ultimately, it is to maximize the happiness in individuals and collective level. So, there are so many plethora of books available which talks about happiness, how to increase happiness. Some of these books are from the layman perspective, some of these books are uh, related to or written by experts or subject experts or researchers. Uh, so, if you if you look at Amazon or any other bookstore, no, there will be plethora of books on happiness which shows that this concept is so many so many ideas and so many uh, books are available and many of these books are actually best sellers which shows that people are really you know craving to understand about it and it plays very important role in all our life because ultimately we all are seeking happiness for most of its history if you see the psychology as a discipline uh, has been concerned with disorders i think i have mentioned it in some of the earlier lecture also uh, that uh, psychology may majorly focused if you see historically in its growth uh, mostly it was focusing on disorders and uh, state of mind such as anxiety depression neurosis obsession paranoia delusions and so on uh, one of the main reason was that you know this were needed immediate attention from the researchers because they were creating problems for individuals and as well as for the society these were becoming a burden, a disease burden on the society. So, that fixing of them needs better understanding of these negative emotions. So, more and more research and funding was going in those direction. So, that, that is why a lot of actually most of this research will, was available in the direction of negative emotions. So, because the need was there, funding was going in those direction. Applied aspect was much more in the negative emotions. So, these are some of the reasons why more research is available even if you, if today also if you look at the literature more and more uh, research will be available in the context of negative emotion as compared to positive emotions i think in the last lecture we have talked about it the goal of practitioner was to bring patients from negative ailing state to a normal state so that was kind of focus from the very negative dysfunctional state to how to make them normal kind of human being you know bring back to the normalcy so that was the idea over the decades particularly uh, <coughs> you know from uh, 2000 onwards there was a rise of positive psychology a few psychology started looking at you know positive emotions particularly and happiness and well being so some uh, at least researchers are coming in those direction also nowadays the study of happiness has long been under the preview of uh, philosophical uh, speculations so a lot of uh, mostly the cons this subject of happiness was discussed in the realm of philosophy and theology uh, and it was more like of speculations and uh, theorizing and mostly of you know it, it, it was talking in terms of theoretical perspective and philosophical speculations. So, 
there was not much empirical data or actually collecting data from real people in the world and then making some conclusion and because uh, philosophy is mostly you know, uh, the discipline of philosophy is mostly focusing on you know speculations and logical analysis and so on psychology as a discipline however the approach and methodology is very different it is more empirical data oriented and that is why with the rise of positive psychology more and more data oriented research came into the picture and now we have much more information and data also available regarding uh, the concept of happiness so during the last decades uh, with the development of reliable and valid measures many reliable and valid measures have been developed uh, including questionnaires and some other uh, ways of measuring uh, data uh, measuring uh, or detecting data led to development of empirical literature in the field of happiness uh, which kind of help you know the literature is evolving and at least we have a lot of data and some of these things we will be discussing in today's lecture as well as the next lecture so what is the what is the meaning of happiness particularly when we talk about it uh, in the literature of psychology now before that uh, there are uh, when this concept is asked to people what is happiness everybody has their own definition you know we'll see some of this for example even you know great thinkers had their own definition of happiness because it's a very subjective concept and people can define it in their own ways for example you know rousseau said uh, happiness means a good bank account a good cook and a good digestion so it was his way you uh, know uh, sarcastic way or kind of humorous way of defining happiness so it is more uh, talking in terms of having money you know good food and good ability to digest that is happiness for him albert uh, schwitzer said happiness is nothing more than the health and a poor memory so that was his way of uh, talk, defining happiness so if you have a good health and poor memory basically in the context of too much of remembering things can create a lot of issues so if you can forget a lot of things it will increase happiness in your life mark twain said happiness consists of good friends good books and a sleepy conscience so it is another way of looking at it aristotle said happiness is the meaning and purpose of life the whole aim and end of human existence so aristotle's idea is is really very significant even in many perspectives in psychological literature also takes aristotle idea so for him happiness is about finding meaning and purpose in life it's a very important concept uh, we'll be looking at it uh, some of these ideas are included in the literature of psychology also so according to him finding meaning and purpose gives happiness in human life so in psychology how the concept of happiness is dealt with how it is defined let us see one of the most prominent researcher in the field of uh, happiness is ed diner he defined subjective well being so it's a, it's a technical term for happiness so it basically means happiness it is more technical way of because happiness term is generally avoided in the technical literature people use it but uh, somehow more technical um, aspects of literature talks about subjective well being because happiness is because as i said as we have already seen people have many ideas about the happiness layman because it is mostly associated with layman idea so everybody can define so many ways uh, of definition could be there around happiness so but when we talk about research we cannot talk about different definitions we have to everybody has to agree on something then only we can talk do research if everybody has their own definition of happiness then that there is no meaning there is no way of comparing the literature comparing the studies and results so subjective well being is a technical term that was used for happiness and it is defined in a very specific terms and in the psychological literature when happiness or subjective well being is measured it is measured in a very same way for it is same for everybody so now now so therefore it, now results of the different studies can be compared because everybody is measuring same thing so that is why the word happiness is generally avoided and a more technical term subjective well being is used so subjective well being how it is measured or how it is defined it is defined in terms of satisfaction with life plus effect effect here basically means emotions so if you if you can if you break this uh, 
kind of uh, uh, this formula we can write it in another way subjective well being equal to high positive emotion low negative emotion so this is affect part that we have talked about here high positive emotion plus low negative emotion means higher the positive emotion one experience and lesser proportionately lesser negative emotion then this affect then the score of subjective well being higher plus high life satisfaction the more satisfied with are you with your life the better the higher score in the happiness so happiness score is measured in terms of higher positive emotions plus higher life satisfaction so the as the scores of these two thing will increase happiness is also going to increase so this is how every researcher looks at subjective well being or happiness so in the research realm you cannot have n number of definition you have, everybody has to agree on something so this is an agreed definition of happiness or a technically it is called as a subjective well being mostly it is measured using self rating questionnaires now for this kind of concepts only way to measure this kind of concept is rating scales are used because we have to ask a person about his life satisfaction you cannot measure it in a, in any other ways it is the person they who will be able to tell whether that person is satisfied with his life or not whether he is experiencing more positive emotions and less negative emotions so rating scale questions are questionnaire are used and people are asked questions and they rate it on a scale of let's say 5 point or 7 point whatever it is and they indicate the level of satisfaction in their with their life level of positive emotions they are experiencing because there is no other way uh, people can corroborate lot of other evidences but the direct evidence only come from the individual himself one has to ask the person about his subjective experiences of life so in this kind of cases mostly self rating questionnaires are used so now this is something we need to understand that happiness means this specific things in the literature of psychology when we are talking about happiness not anything else so life satisfaction plus emotions particularly higher the positive emotion the more happiness is experienced now life satisfaction represents one assessment of one's own life when we talk about life satisfaction it is more about how you assess your life so there can be many ways of assessment of life sometimes people assess certain domains of their life like workplace or personal life and so on sometimes people can assess their life as a whole how satisfied they are taking everything together so that is how people cognitively judge given everything in the present condition of their life how satisfied they are with their life so that is called life satisfaction affect represent as i have already said the emotional part of it and emotion has both positive emotion negative emotions so when we talk about happiness the idea is there will be more positive emotion and less negative emotions now let us look into the concept of happiness uh, through a model of happiness proposed by root winhoven so root winhoven is basically a not a psychologist but uh, most his re his research takes a lot of ideas from this positive psychology literature so he is a dutch sociologist uh, not a psychologist but sociologist but his most of the researcher are kind of related to positive psychology and happiness he is one of the pioneer uh, researcher in the field of happiness he explained happiness using the concept of quality of life and life satisfaction so let us see his model how he uh, kind of looked at happiness and quality of life so quality of life he said can be defined quality of a human life so everybody has a have can have different qualities of life different levels of qualities of life how to measure that quality of life he use certain parameters two broad parameters which can interact with each other to give lot of indicators for quality of life he said one is chances versus outcomes in life what are the chances you know life chances basically are the opportunities that we get in life so everybody get lot of opportunities in their life so those are called the different chances that we get in life so these are different opportunities that we get in life we'll see more in details some of these examples outcomes means what are the outcomes of these opportunities that we get in life how do we use them and 
make things happen. So, outcomes are actualization of those potentials and opportunities. How do you actualize the different opportunities that we get in life and bring out certain outcomes? So, this is one important dimensions to look at quality of life. What are the life chances you have? What are the outcomes you create out of them? So, this is one dimension. Another dimension is outer versus inner quality of life. Outer versus inner quality of life. So, what is the outer quality of life? Outer quality refers to the aspects of the environment. So, everybody lives in an environment. We do not live just anywhere. We, we, we are surrounded by different things in our life, including lot of environmental aspects. You know. So, what kind of environment you are put in, what kind of you know physical environment, whether you are having a good clean environment, healthy environment, less pollution and so on. So, these are different kinds of an co constitute environment in our life. So, it is these are about outer aspects of your life in terms of physical environment that you have. Inner qualities of life basically talks about at the mental level, emotional level, how do you experience life. Inner qualities refer to the qualities of the person particularly at the thought processes at the emotional level how do you experience life so that defines your inner quality of life so so these are the two uh, major parameters and by these parameters there can be different outcomes in terms of different qualities of life so four qualities of life he found based on these two probable important factors so one is outer qualities inner qualities there are life chances, there are life results or life outcomes. So, when they interact together, we get four qualities of life, four important aspects or qualities of life, which determines quality of your life, all these four dimensions. So, when outer qualities of life interact with life chances or life opportunities, it gives to something called livability of the environment. So, when what kind of environment you are kind of fi find yourself, life gives presents you with different kinds of let us say you are born in a certain country or certain societies, it has its own structure and environment. So, it is a kind of life chance that you get and outer aspects we are talking about. So, it gives something called as the livability of the environment. What is the livability of the environment that you find yourself in? So, we will talk discuss more about them. With the outer qualities and life results or outcomes gives to the utility of life, something called what is the utility aspect of your life. We will discuss each of them more detail. Inner qualities when interacts with life chances or opportunities, it gives life ability of the person. From internally how, what are the abilities this person has to deal with different aspects of life. So, because it is inner aspects, not the outer aspect of life and when the inner qualities interacts with life results or outcomes satisfaction with life. So, this is very important that we have discussed in the definition of subjective well being also satisfaction with life. So, it is an outcome whatever has happened now how do you see or that outcome are you satisfied with that outcome of your life whatever has happened in your life. So, and this is inner because you judge in, from inside two person can be in the same situation, but one can feel satisfied or another person may feel dissatisfied. Why? Because this inner aspect is different. How person is looking at that life situation are very different for these two persons. One may be happy, one may not be happy or satisfied. So, that is why it is inner quality of life. So, let us see all these force define each of them. So, livability of the environment, the first one that we uh, have seen here outer qualities when interacts with life chances or life opportunities gives the livability of environment. Now, what is this this one? So, livability of the environment uh, basically talks about physical environment that you are kind of find yourself in around whatever circumstances you are put in uh, life puts you in like pollution level wherever the society or the country you are in uh, global warming degradation of nature. So, it is more about the physical environment they are talking about ecological aspects 
it is rather a precondition for happiness and not all environmental conditions are equally conducive to happiness. So, this will also impact your happiness or quality of life because if your outer environment is not good or conducive, then the livability will be much less and people may not be happy. So, somebody if lives in a very highly polluted area as compared to someone who lives a very clean area, probably their happiness level will be different in terms of livability will be much different, livability index will be different. So, a lot of people in the field of politici politicians and social reformers typically stress this aspect of quality of life. So, most of the political agendas and a lot of things and social reformers generally you know lot of people lot of this kind of people or prof professional groups they uh, focus on this aspect of quality of life much more they try to improve these aspects much more. Then comes life ability of the person. So, this is this year inner qualities and life chances interact to give life ability. Now, life ability basically means it denotes inner life chances in terms of ability. So, whatever life situation you are in, how are you able to cope with that environment and the problems of life? Are you able to deal with them? Are you able to cope with them or you do not you are not able to cope with them? So, that will determine the inner quality of your life. So, this quality of life is central to thinking of therapists and educa edu educators. So, a lot of counselors and therapists they focus on these aspects to enhance the life ability of the person because many times we cannot really change the outer aspect of life because it is not in, in our control. You cannot really suddenly change the pollution level because it is not possible to change it immediately. It needs a collective effort. So, but we can at least deal with the problems, cope with the problems by changing the thinking about it at least to deal with the problems of life or whatever other problems that environment creates or outer circumstances creates. So, many times we do not have much choices to change the outer aspect of life or outer circumstances of life like one may be you know poverty for example, one can may not be immediately able to change his poverty level or something, but one can adapt or adjust to the his life situations. So, that is about life ability of the person. So, a lot of professional groups like therapist, educators focus on enhancing this quality of life. Then comes utility of life. So, this is here outer qualities and life results. So, it represents using life for something more than itself. So, how are you able to utilize your life more in terms of outer aspect of life. So, it is about higher values and meanings such as ecological preservations, cultural development. So, how you are using your life to do something more than just your own life in terms of contributing to the outer life. So, it could be you know preserving environment, so on doing something for the environment, for the society and so on. So, those are called utility of life. People in the professional group like moral advisors such as pastors emphasize this quality of life. So, a lot of moral advisors are focusing on this aspect of life and the last one is inner aspect and satisfaction of life this one inner qualities and life results le leads to satisfaction with life. So, this satisfaction with life it is the as we have already defined it is about inner outcomes of life in terms of subjective judgment of life commonly refers to the terms such as subjective well being. So, I think we have just discussed about this. So, subjective well being one of the major aspect is uh, satisfaction with life, it is also called as happiness. So, this is very important in the conceptualization of Ruth Winhoven's model of quality of life. According to him, satisfaction of life, no specific professional group actually focuses on this part. All the other aspects are given uh, focus by many people, but this is actually most significant and but not really focused by a lot of people. So, according to root life satisfaction is the most appropriate concept of to understand happiness as it reflects the degree to which external living condition fit with your inner abilities. So, it is a very important uh, you know, combination of how outer life and inner life interact to give something called a satisfaction of life and it is more reliable to look at it in order to understand happiness of human beings. Now, root also uh, uh, kind of 
unpacked this idea of life satisfaction a little bit more in terms of adding more dimensions or looking at the dimensions of it little bit in more detail. So, they said life satisfaction can have different meanings also. This meaning can also be charted into four like another fourfold matrix where you know we can talk about life satisfaction in terms of life aspects or certain part of life versus life as a whole. So, satisfaction with a one as certain aspect of your life or satisfaction life with life as a whole. So, we can look at life satisfaction using these two concepts. Also, we can talk about life satisfaction with the concept of passing satisfaction. Is it a temporary satisfaction or it is an enduring satisfaction? So, again with the interaction of these two broad dimensions, four dimensions can lead to four concepts in satisfaction of life. So, these are the four possible. So, whenever something is part of life means not the whole life in some aspect of your life and you are satisfied with the passing aspect means temporary for temporary time then it is called as a pleasure. Certain aspect of your life you are experiencing satisfaction but it is temporary. So, this is called as pleasure because it is temporary then uh, with the temporary with the life as a whole that is called as a top experiences. So, when sometimes people experience some very ecstatic state in certain time of life it, it may not be permanent, but something comes together for some people doing something you know and then they feel certain ecstatic state. Sometimes some scientists doing finding something very innovative or some poet finding some lines and so on it gives a ecstatic feeling at that time. So, those are called as a top experiences we will be talking about that. Enduring means more long term satisfaction with certain part of life certain aspect of life is called part satisfaction then long term satisfaction with whole life is called as life satisfaction. So, this is the concept that is the real concept of life satisfaction according to the root model proper life satisfaction is life satisfaction long term satisfaction with the life as a whole. So, pleasures as we have already kind of looked at it, it is about passing satisfaction. It is a very short term satisfaction with certain aspect of your life. It can be a sensory uh, satisfaction such as good food, mental it should be reading an interesting book. So, sometimes we get a good food, it can give you a lot of pleasure. So, this is an example of pleasure because it, it is a sensory short term satisfaction with very small aspect of it like food or sometimes it could be mental satisfaction like reading a good book, but it is temporary because it is limited to that reading of book, book itself. Part satisfaction is about more long term satisfaction with a certain aspect of your life, not a whole as whole life. So, it is mostly concerned with the domain of life such as work life. So, one may be satisfied with work life and may not be satisfied with other domains such as family life. So, part satisfaction is about certain part of life you are satisfied, but certain part of life you may not be satisfied. So, that is called as a part satisfaction. So, some people are satisfied with their personal life may not be satisfied with the work life or vice versa. Top experience is about it is a passing satisfaction because it is not a long term satisfaction, but it could be temporary satisfaction, but about whole life. So, it may include intense oceanic experiences referred by poets and mystics. People in the spiritual field or some poet or creative field experiences peak experiences some sometimes when things comes in together and they find something. So, so this is like it gives a add satisfaction to their whole life not about one aspect of life. So, they feel fulfilled in certain sense. Life satisfaction as we said it is the true concept in terms of uh, long term satisfaction with your whole life, then it is true life satisfaction. You are satisfied with your whole life, every aspect of your life and it is should it is not should, should not be a temporary like today I am satisfied and tomorrow I am not satisfied, then it is not true life satisfaction. True life satisfaction should be relatively enduring and long term and commonly referred to as happiness. So, we have already kind of discussed that. So, in this model happiness is again about more about life satisfaction. So, life satisfaction according to uh, root model is also is that is, you know, is is the most appropriate concepts to look for policy making. 
by different agencies, government or NGOs and so on. Why? Because it is long term concept, it impacts your life in the long term and it is much more valuable than the passing or short term satisfaction and it is about your whole life. So, your judgment about whole life or enduring satisfaction is most important indicator for your quality of life or the happiness of life or subjective well-being of your life. So, policies should look into this aspect more than other aspect of life because this is more consequential to human life. It will have much more deeper impact on life. So, policies should look into this aspect according to his model uh, and this is because most important idea. So, these are some of the takeaway of the model of Ruth Winhoven. Now, let us see what do we know really what makes us happy or of what gives us happiness. So, if, 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 if we ask people, do you know what makes you happy? People may say some people for some people may be relationship, a good relationship will make them happy. People may have different answer for this for, for some may be a new job or a better family more money, some for some may be losing weight, for some may be looking better, for some may be having a child or baby may give them lot of happiness. So, people may have different concepts or different things according to them which may make them happy. So, we constantly judge or kind of make forecasts that if I get this, I will be happy. So, constantly we are projecting things in future and trying to achieve them so that we feel or experience happiness. But the more fundamental question is will we or do we become happier when we get those things that we kind of feel like if I get this much money or if I get this thing or if I get this. When we actually achieve them do we really become that kind of happy happier person as we have kind of forecasted earlier. Can we predict what makes us happy in the future? So, this is a very important question and a lot of some of the research has tried to address this because we are constantly predicting if I get this and this and then, then we are making goals and trying to achieve them, uh, but do we really become happier when we achieve them. So, that is an important question which is connected to the concept of effective forecasting. Effective forecasting, how do you forecast certain emotional as aspect of your life includes prediction we make about emotional reactions to future events. So, in future something happens, how, what will be our emotional experiences? We keep predicting it all the time. So, if I get this in my life or if I, whatever you know, if you get a car or if you get a bike or whatever it is, I will be the happiest person in life. So, we constantly predicting the emotional consequences of getting something in life in the future. So, that is called as an effective forecasting, forecasting in the future and what are the emotional consequences to it. Now, the research on this aspect called effective forecasting has shown that people generally mispredict how much pleasures or displeasures a future event will bring. This Wilson and Gilbert are the two prominent researcher who did a most of the significant research in this area of effective forecasting and they found that people generally mispredict how much happy happiness a particular thing they will give them or how much displeasure or sadness they, uh, they will get if something happens, some negative thing happens in life. So, prediction is generally not right. Most of the prediction that we do are generally not correct most of the time. So, we make lot of erroneous decisions or erroneous predictions about future emotional consequence of events in life. So, we will see some of these things. So, generally people are good at predicting if they get this or that they will make give them happiness or not. So, that prediction is generally ok, but people are not good at predicting the intensity and duration, intensity and duration of future emotional reactions. For what will be the intensity of emotional experience and what duration for how much we will be experiencing that emotion if we get something in future. So, that is generally mispredicted. So, you may think if you get something a dream object or a dream car for example, we, you may say I will be ha very happy and this happiness will last for a long time. No, So, like that is what we generally predict. 
So, this is where we mispredict the intensity and duration for how intense our emotional experiences will be or how long the emotional experiences will experience that. So, that is generally mispredicted is called is something that research found. So, occasionally people underestimate and more commonly overestimate. People overestimate the intensity of emotion. If they get something good, they overestimate how happy they will be. They estimate they will be very happy and if something bad they predict, they feel that their life will be highly miserable or very sad. So, they overestimate things both positive and negative. Generally, people overestimate. Sometimes they can underestimate also but generally they overestimate. So, that is why it is misprediction. So, they overestimate the intensity and duration of their emotional reaction to future events. So, this is something they found. So, this particular phenomena is called as impact bias. So, impact bias is it is the error that people make by overestimating the intensity and duration of their emotional reaction to future events. So, this phenomena is called as an impact bias. It is a part of effective forecasting impact bias happens. So, people overestimate the intensity and duration of the emotional reactions. So, how happy you will become if you get let us say a dream object that you are desiring. So, people generally overestimate, they overestimate, they think they will be much more happier than actually when they get it or they will think they will be happier for a very long time. But in actuality, it is it, it happens for a very short time. So, that is what is the meaning of impact bias. This happens for both positive and negative emotions. For example, we may overestimate how happy or unhappy we would become if we get a desirable and undesirable things respectively in future. So, this overestimates happen for both positive as well as negative events. So, this is an example of uh, Wilson and Gilbert study. It is a very small study they did, a lot of other studies are there where they ask college student. Uh, when they joined an institution or an university, uh, they predicted the actual level of happiness after dormitory assignment. So, participants predicted what their overall level of happiness would be a year later and they were randomly assigned to desirable and undesirable dormitory. So, this is basically the condition is that then when uh, basically college student joined, uh, they were asked to predict if they get a desirable dormitory for some condi some uh, participants and for some participant they asked if they get undesirable with certain characteristics, those details are not here, undesirable dormitory, how happy or uh, what will be their happiness level after a year. So, they are asked to make some future prediction. So, they will get some dormitory, it may be desirable or undesirable according to certain criteria. How it will impact their happiness after a year, you know, so in future. So, that is something they are asked. So, they were, they would be a year later if they were randomly assigned to a desirable or undesirable dormitory. Student predicted that their dormitory assignment would have a large positive or negative impact. So, they were when initially they predicted, and after one year, their actual happiness was measured when they got desirable or undesirable in both conditions. So, randomly, there were some dormitories which are desirable, some dormitories which were undesirable, and they predicted first and then they stayed in those dormitories and actual measure. Uh, X happiness was measured after a year. So, you can in this graph you can see what happens. So, when desirable uh, dormitory was asked what will be their happiness after a year, they predicted they will be very happy their happiness level score was much higher here and uh, this was an actual happiness after a year when it is measured. So, there was some mismatch. So, the prediction was much higher their whatever they expected their happiness actually it was less when after a year there it was measured so, intensity in terms of intensity. So, they are measured using sometimes scale 7 point scale. In case of undesirability also if you see they predicted they will be much less happier happiness score was much less here 
it is much less here and when they predicted desirable dormitory the happiness was almost double uh, it was much more than that so this was but when actually after a year they were measured in those undesirable dormitory their happiness was much higher actually actual ha happiness so if you see in both desirable and undesirable the actual happiness me when measured after a year was almost same but the prediction was much different so in desirability the prediction was predicted much higher in undesirable the prediction uh, the happiness level prediction was much lower so this shows that we generally it's a case where we under overestimate both positive and negative uh, emotional state when we predict some future consequences okay future events associated with certain emotions when actually this happens things are not that high either in terms of negativity in or in terms of positivity now why this happens why this impact bias happens so the researcher found that one of the reason why this happens is called as focalism what is focalism here focalism basically means it's a tendency to overestimate how much we will think about the event in the future and underestimate the e extent of which other events will influence our thoughts and feelings it basically means when we are predicting that if you get something what will be the con emotional consequences we are only thinking about that event in the future so let's say you think that if you get a job a dream job how much happiness it will give so you are only thinking about the positive aspect of that job will give in your life so you'll be settled you will get lot of money you will can fulfill lot of desires so you are only thinking about that job what this job will give in terms of whatever you no know, you are expecting but what happens when actually you get this job so lot of this thing will be there no doubt but the new life situation new job will also give lot of other problems in life so you may, you may have to work hard a lot of other you have to adjust with lot of other people so many other things may come with the package which we don't consider at the time of prediction when actually this happens so many other things we need to take care of so all this other thing will also influence your happiness so while predicting you are not looking into all these things we are only looking at the job what the things job will give you but when you are getting actually that job so many other problems will also come with it you have to work hard so many other issues adjustment with the boss and other colleagues and so on all these thing will influence your emotions or let's say in this case happiness will be reduced because of so many other problems of associated with the job so when you actually get this the happiness level will be much less as compared to when you predicted because when you predicted you were only looking at the positive aspect of the job you are not aware of so many other things so all these things other event will influence our thoughts and feelings so that is called as focalism while predicting we only focus on something so that is why it is called focalism so this is one of the reason why people mispredict another reason is called making sense of novel and unexpected event people adapt very quickly when we think we will get if i get something in future i will be very happy but when we get that we adapt to it very quickly then after some time it no longer gives you that kick that happiness that was when you got it initially simply because you get adapted to it is no longer a novel thing so the novelty gets lost so wherever whenever we see something for the first time obviously the novel aspect novelty aspects gives lot of happiness but then next time when you see the same thing it no longer gives you that happiness simply because it is no longer new thing you you are already aware know about it so that is called as a making sense of novel and unexpected events so this uh, also reduces when actually things happens very soon we get adapted to them very soon our emotional intensity goes down when we predict we think it will be staying for a long time but actually when it happens we adapted get it adapted to very quickly because novelty is get lost and very ra rapidly we uh, make sense of new things and it becomes an old thing no longer a new thing 
So, these are two major reasons why this misprediction happens. Now, this impact bias can impact a lot of our decisions in life because we mostly take decision based under emotional influences. We take a lot of decisions in life and when emotions are there, we, there this impact bias can happen and if we overestimate the emotional consequences, we will de take decisions accordingly, but in reality the things may be very different. So, many times we can it can lead to wrong judgment, no wrong decision making in life. So, this effective forecast and impact bias may influence decision ranging from small thing like which route you should take while going, going to some place, like some places may give you a lot of emotional value like you know some scenic beauty is there in one route and another route it is not there. So, emotion will influence your decision where which route you should take or it could be profound decision of your life to whom you should marry or not. These are also a lot of emotions are involved in how should you choose your life partner and so on. And many time we while predicting we can overestimate the emotional part of it. And when things happen in reality the whole emotional aspect could be very different. So, that is why sometimes a uh, lot of decision can be you know we may make wrong decisions based on impact biases. So, people generally make decisions by projecting their emotional reaction to future events most of the time. This impact bias can lead to mistaken projections and irrational unbiased decisions in their life. People make lot of many times wrong decision because of this factor. People sometimes also show retrospective impact bias means whatever has happened in the past. Now, people overestimate their emotional experience when actually that happened it may not be that high where they overestimate the impact of past event of their happiness on their happinesses past events when actually it happened probably that, that was not that impactful. Now, you when you look back probably many times we overestimate the impact of a past event explaining why people do not learn from past, ex past experiences because they again kind of overestimate lot of things in the present context. So, many time people do not learn from it. So, retrospective impact pass can also happen sometimes in our life. So, it may be um, not so easy to correct this lot of this impact bias because emotion can happen very unconsciously automatically, uh, but we can reduce such biases by becoming more conscious and thinking more rationally, analyzing things more looking at different aspects and consequences, uh, more rational thought processes should by in involving them probably we can reduce a lot of this impact bias. So, with this I stop here, uh, these are some of the aspects that we talked about co the concept of happiness. In the next lecture, we will be talking more about the concept of happiness and particularly the applied aspects, uh, how to understand happiness and can it be kind of enhanced in our life to increase the quality of life. So, those aspects we will be looking in the next lecture. With this I stop here, thank you. Mm -hmm.